This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. I'd like to start off, first of all, um, by saying I'm humbled to stand here today. And I'm really speaking on behalf of Rabbi Kalish, Rabbi Sunshine, and the whole Chabura. And I'd like to really start off by thanking everyone for coming. A lot of people um, drove from far, some people drove from closer. Um, Shout out to my father who came. Um, Very, very, it means a lot to myself. And um, many, many people came. You look around the room, Chaim Tzvi, his Revitzin, and it just feels like this is all our Chabura, a warm, a warm Chabura together, gathering together. And the point of this, the point of this gathering is really to commemorate, for lack of a better word, and to speak and to, and to, and to mourn and to heal at the passing of our Rebbe, Rabbi Overlander. And the amount of people that are here, and I'm sure there are going to be more people that are walking through the door, is, is a testament to who our Rebbe was, what he stood for, and the impact that he had on our lives. And I know that there are people in our Yisrael, there are people all over that would love to be here and they can't be here, but they're going to listen to the recordings. You have there's hundreds and thousands of people that are going to be impacted by, by tonight. And just interesting that one of uh, a, very, a very close Talmud of Rabbi Oberlander is, is Ari Litzman. And as a joke, I said, I'm going to shout you out. But to bring out the, the beauty of our Rebbe, is he's away right now with his family at a family event, family weekend. And I said to Ari, I said, you're not coming? And he says to me, I'm not sure. I said, what do you mean? Like, you, you come to everything. And, and if anyone knows Ari, you have a simcha, you have something, he comes to anything. He's in Denver with his family. Why are you not coming? And he says it's very hard for me. He had a flight booked. But he said he knows that Rebbe would want him to stay with his family. And it's not a cute story. That's who Rabbi Oberlander was. And he put family in front of everyone else. And to, for Ari Litzman not to be here is, is emotional and, and says so much. Just, just the fact that Ari Litzman is not here. Of course, the fact that everyone else is here. And he's not here just says so much about Rabbi Oberlander. And just to give a little structure um, you know, to, the, to the night... Um, there's going to be a few speeches, and I believe, uh, you know, to, a little bit later on, we're going to have singing, and people will be able to share their, their emotions, how they're feeling, and again, heal, and, and really just discuss Rebbe, who he was, who he is, how he means to every single person on an individual level. I'm going to start off, and I'm going to say a few words about my um, personal relationship to Rabbi Oberlander, and what I think we've benefited from, from him as a Chabura. And then I'll pass the mic on to Rabbi Sonnenschein. So I just, when, when we found out that we lost um, Rabbi Oberlander, I wrote a letter to the family. And I'm, it, at the Shiva, someone asked me, can, we, can I put it in the FJJ? And there's nothing wrong with that. I, 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 I said no, because I, I said I have to think about it, because... I feel that this is such a, it's such a personal, like, private thing, and to share it here, and I, and I know it's on recording, but anyone who's listening to this is family. We're Chabura, we're family, and, and, I, and it's an emotional letter to me. It came from my heart, not from my, not from my brain, but I want to start off by, by sharing it. So I wrote, Dear Oberlander family, we lost a father and a Rebbe. As Rebbe always says, there are no words. Sitting at the Leviah and listening to all the speeches seems surreal. Is this really Rebbe? How can it be? How can we move forward without our father and Rebbe? The pain is extremely difficult. In no way can we answer these questions. One thing we can do as a Talmud and child is to recognize and thank you for the beautiful, loving father you shared with us. Rebbe has been there for us through the good times and the difficult times, always supporting us in our ways. From a lost soul in high school to base medrash, dating, marriage, children, there was no step of the way that Rebbe wasn't there holding our hands in the most humble way. The beautiful Friday night's miras and random Tuesday night l'chaims, for those that know, 
so many treasures and experiences you allowed us to have with him. The house was always open to us, and your family accepted us as brothers. There was no differentiation. Seeing Rebbe as a husband and father, so calm and gentle, yet so organized and full of accomplishments, always, always there for another person, never a dull moment. We owe Rebbe the world, and we'll always live with Rebbe because he is our essence and our very existence. We will be there for your family as you were there for us. Hashem should give you the strength to continue to impact your extended family on behalf of Rebbe, and we should be together with Rebbe very soon with the building of Mashiach, Moish Greenall, the Lucky Talmud. That's the, that's the letter I wrote. Those are the feelings and the emotions that I have, and, and, I, and I'm expressing this to us as a family because I know everyone here that's here tonight and people that aren't here tonight feel this way. I, I wrote down points about Rabbi Oberlander, and, and as we know, when, when you're being masvid, the person is here, and, we, and, and Rebbe is here, and it's very hard to speak. But I just want to paint the picture about the personal impact that Rebbe had on my life and many others. And this is in no specific order, so I apologize for that. So to start with the Shavuos programs, we definitely did it for two years, maybe a third year. But it was Rabbi Overlander and his Rebbetzin's mission to, make, to give us an impactful Shavuos. And Shavuos is a time where when you're married and you're maybe part of a community, maybe not, to, to, to go from a, from a yeshiva guy learning, enjoying, having a fun night, and then you come to Shavuos, and you're like, you have the mail, like, should I go learn, should I not? And he, and he made it a moment. He made it a place where everyone wanted to come. He put out the message, and it was booked months in advance. So that idea, that, that was just something that, ex, that we've all experienced, we've loved, and, and Again, just a small, just a small but, but large thing about Rabbi Overlander, again, how he impacted our lives so much. Um, another, again, r- you know, random thing is that um, there, was, there was some, I, I was at, at a time at Rabbi Overlander's house. I slept there for a few months, and there was someone else that was sleeping there with me, and he had a concussion at the time, and therefore he came back to Waterbury, and we were roommates together. And the cure that Rabbi Overlander had for this guy... What, you, you can't describe it. Every morning he would, he, would, he would wake him up, ask him how he was doing, and sit there for, for a lot of time taking care of this guy. And, he's a, and everyone knows, everyone is a busy guy. He has his two phones and everything's moving. And he sat and he gave this guy attention and he literally healed him. Another um, experience that we've had, we've all experienced this driving back and forth with, with Rabbi Oberlander. The long drives, I don't even remember to, whether it's to a wedding a simcha, who knows where, and just being there in the passenger seat, he's on the phone answering both WhatsApps, and still you feel like you're getting all the attention in the world. Like, how is that even possible? And, and, we've, and we've all shared that and all experienced that. Another, another thing that I want to mention, and everyone I'm sure has a very similar uh, experience, is, and my father actually reminded me of this, is before I got married and many others, Rabbi Oberlander, of course, was very involved. And right before the wedding, he sent a tutorial how to put on a talus. And when we were discussing this, my father and I, we said, which rep? That's, that's not normal. That's like, you're, who would even think of how to put on a talus? My father said it took him 20 years to learn how to put on a talus. That's, that's just the nature of it. And he said, no, we're going to prepare you. We're going to make sure, and it was a two-minute, I think someone has the clip still, it was a two-minute clip, how to put on a talus, when to make the bracha, which way to go. Just the, the small basic things that you wouldn't think of, he thought of, and he was there. Um, just a few, a few things that I was looking back at some messages and, um, you know, asking Rabbi how he's doing and, and the constant messages of every day is a bracha, enough about me, always just appreciating life and, and looking to push away the attention from, from himself. I've personally learned with Rabbi Chumash, Rashi, Gemara, we've learned Shmuel, we've learned Navi together, we learned Mishnah Brua, we had a Mishnah Brua here, we learned Tashkafa about marriage. We've had, in, for, for many, many weeks or months, we've had in Zundel, I'm not sure where Zundel is right now, can't see him, but we've had in Zundel's house a beautiful Thursday night Chabura, and this is recently, um, Yitzhi Jackness came and, and many others, and it was such a beautiful event. We're all working, and we come back, and we sit with Rabbi Overlander, and he was at Heichal, 
and he sat there with us for hours. And eventually, it even turned into every other week or every week, the women, he would give a shear to the women. And this is something no one, no one would even know about. He just did a bitsina. While he was at his date, he would come, he would give us a shear, he would spend time with us, give us life, and, and continue with his, you know, continue on. Um, so, it's actually interesting. Also, he sent me a, a message also recently before Pesach, when he was, definitely wasn't doing well, and he sent the message just about the Haggadah, a thought about the Haggadah. He couldn't give a live shear, but he said, I want to send you a thought about the Haggadah to inspire your yantif. So, just to, to, you know, to end off, when, when a tzaddik passes, we know he's Kruim Chaim, called, he's called alive. And what, I, what I've realized here today, over this period of time, is that we, of, course, when he was, of course when he was alive, he was a, he was a tzaddik. Everyone knows that. But now, when he's now when he's when he passed away, we all realize how alive he is, because ha- it's not that he was alive then; and he's not alive now. He's alive now, even more, because now we understand and now we realize that every single step of our life, every single, and I can say this for everyone here: we've all asked him questions. You look back at your messages, you look back at your texts. Every single step of our lives, he guided us. He was our life, and he is our life, and he still is our life, and he's and he'll always be our life, because all the messages that he's taught us. He continues to teach us, and we're continuing to live that life. So, I'm going to read this. The message that Rabbi Oberlander gave us is to be a simple Jew, a great father, community member, worker, or boss, and do what Hashem wants and what's right. To live internally without fanfare and to build from within. To be there for others and to truly work on oneself. To dive in and learn with meaning, with meaning and read your child a bedtime story with intention. To remain level-headed and calm, even in difficult times. Our mission as, Tal- as Talmidim is to live what he taught us, each in our own way, and continue on the path of serving Hashem, as he would want us to do, and keep him and his teachings very close to us throughout our lives. So I'd like to introduce Rabbi Sun and Shine, and again, really thank everyone for being here, thank the Oberlander family, thank the whole commu- the Waterbury community, thank our extended Chabura for being here and gathering here to, to hear words of Chizak, to hear words about Rabbi Oberlander, and to share our emotions, and ultimately everything we do tonight should be as chus for his neshama, and, and our entire life should be as chus for his neshama, because we're all living what he taught us. I want to describe something about the, the feeling of standing here and of being here tonight. And I want to describe it by quoting Rabbi Oberlander. About a week ago, Rabbi Zev Saflis, Rabbi Oberlander's brother-in-law, sent me, sent me a recording of Rabbi Oberlander speaking. And it took me a few days till I was able to listen to it, like many of us. It took me a long time to be able to listen to voice notes. And it took me even longer to listen to him speaking to Talmidim. And the shear that he gave was to the, the, the student body in Heichel. And it was upon him returning after having been out when he was ill for a long time. And what he says says so much about who he was and about what tonight is. He, say, he asks Akasha, if you can ask Akasha like this Kasha, it's, a, it's another level. His Kasha was that through this whole journey that he was going through, dealing with an illness, he's working on the Midah of Simcha. And he's achieved such Simcha that he doesn't know what to be Maisif when Adar comes. What should he be Maisif? 
That was his kasha. Can you believe it? He's standing there in yeshiva with his talmidim, with his newer talmidim, and he says, Hashem sent me the answer. Being here is the answer. This is what adds to my simcha. Being with the people that I learn Torah with. Being the people that I share my life with. I'm sure that many of you have this feeling that we're here tonight in so much pain and so happy to see everyone. It's so special, each face that we haven't seen in a long time. To see the island together, to come together. It's what we're all about. It's what we've always done. It's what we believe in. It's what gives us chizuk. It's what gave Rabbi Oberlander so much chizuk and the chizuk that he gave us. And yet, it's such a tsar. The reason that we have to be here. And those two emotions are mixing together. And I don't know about you, but somehow they're not a, they're not a contradiction inside me. Somehow the joy of seeing everyone together and the tsar of missing Rabbi Oberlander is fitting together. I was speaking with the Talmud of Rabbi Oberlander a few days ago. And we were talking about the fact that he was nifter very young. And this Talmud expressed that even though we lost Rabbi Oberlander at such a young age, he said when he thinks about him, he doesn't think about someone who had a compromised, cut-off life. There was a full, full, vibrant life with such accomplishments. And I realized that his accomplishments were enormous. And what he did for the world, and for the world of, of and for Klal Yisrael, and for us, and for our families, is enormous. His life wasn't too short. His life was too short for us. It feels like it was too short, it was too brief for us. And we're here tonight, as Moish said so beautifully, so eloquently, and Rebbe would have been so, so proud of those words. But we're here tonight to try to live his message a little bit and to talk about him so that for us we can try to heal and to, and to be mismaided and to deal with and to grow from a life that to us was so, so much too short. <clears throat> the Gemara tells us that there are seven Shamayims. There are seven Rekiyim. The sun and the moon belong in the Shamayim called Rakia. That's where Hashem put them. Two floors up, there's Shechakim on top of the Rakia, and then there's Zavul on top of the Shechakim. The Gemara says in Chagiga and Daf Yudbez. The Shemesh and Yoreach, the sun and the moon, bumped themselves up two floors, the Gemara says in the Dharam Daflamites, because they wanted to make a protest to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. They were protesting. So they jumped up towards the Kisei HaKavod. Shemesh v'yoreach omad zvula. What were they protesting? That Kairach was questioning the leadership, the Hanhagos, of Moshe Rabbeinu. And the sun and the moon came in front of the Kisei HaKavod and they said very strong words to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. They said, Im ata oise din leben Amram, if you will stand up for Moshe Rabbeinu, anu me'irim, we will shine. Ve'im lav, and if you will not stand up for Moshe Rabbeinu, ein anu me'irim, we will not shine. And my question to you tonight is why the sun and the moon? Of all the parts of Hashem's beautiful and complex world, why the sun and the moon? Kairach's argument was very layered. 
there were bad midos there, there was ambition there. But on some level, Kairach came with a certain ideology, a certain taina to Moshe Rabbeinu. And his taina sounds so good. His taina was all Yidna Halig. Kikol ha'eda kulam kedayshim. The whole Klal Yisrael is, is Halig. Ubesoicha Mashem. Umaduat is Nasu al Kahal Hashem. Why are you different? Why are you special? I couldn't agree more with Kairach. Yes, every yid is halig. Every yid is infinitely valuable. Every yid is part of the a part of Hakadosh Baruch Hu's plan. What what makes you the leader of Klal Yisrael? He taunted Moshe Rabbeinu. You have a room full of Sifrei Torah. Does it need a mezuzah? And Moshe Rabbeinu said, of course. Of course it needs a mezuzah. It's like, are you kidding me? The whole room is full of Sifrei Torah. I need to put a parsha on the door? The whole... kulam kedoshim. You need someone standing by the door? But on the fourth day of creation, Rabbi say, Hashem created two sons. And one of those sons came to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and said that there's no reason for us to be redundant of each other. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu, instead of having two sons in the sky, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave one the job of being the sun by day, a whole world of a job, the job of the sun, the daytime, a time of joy and clarity and avoida and action. And he gave the other one a different job, to give light in the darkness, the job of the moon. To be there, a guiding light when it's dark and scary, when it's a time to sleep and to shut down. Instead of having two redundant suns, HaKadosh Baruch Hu showed the Bria that redundancy is not what this world is about. Each nivra has a makayim. Each nivra has a place. I want to suggest that one of the great tragedies of Parshas Kairach is not just that he wanted to be the Nasi of the Bnei Kahas. Not just that he questioned Moshe Rabbeinu. Not just that he was focused on Aaron's job. The tragedy of Parshas Kairach is that Kairach wasn't trying to be Kairach. The tragedy of Parshas Kairach is that he was so focused on who he wanted to be and the position he wanted to hold that he neglected to be Kairach. We could have benefited, benefited from a Kairach, a Kairach, a tzaddik. We could have benefited from a Kairach that knows his role in the Bria, that understands why Hashem sent him to where he did, that's comfortable being Kairach. But Kairach was uncomfortable being Kairach. He wanted to be this one, or perhaps that one, or depending on which Chazal, the other one. He wanted to be anything but Kairach. That's a tragedy. And one of the things... And Mamela, the sun and the moon, who learned that each thing in the Bria has its place, came to Taina from Moshe Rabbeinu. No, it's not true. The whole Klal Yisrael is holy and therefore nobody should be different than anybody else. That's not the message. Everyone is holy and everyone has a makayim. Everyone has a place. Everyone has a role. Everyone has a job. Everyone has something that's immeasurable to contribute to Malchus Shramayim. And on both ends, Rabbi say, Rabbi Oberlander taught us this. How many of us, myself included, how many of us felt more confident in what we were doing and in what we were contributing and in us being able to be ourselves because of the chizuk that he gave us. But even deeper than that, 
Did you pick it up when you spent time with him? A few Talmud mentioned to me over the last week, he was so unbelievably comfortable being Rabbi Avi Oberlander. One never got the sense that he wanted to be anybody else. He was a hundred percent miyushiv in the role that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave him. And boy, did he excel in that role. He knew who he was. There was no imposter syndrome. There was no worrying about the next job. There was no diunim about how he feels about himself. There was none of that. You knew him. You knew him well. He was just Rabbi Oberlander. He was just completely comfortable. And I suspect from the people I've been speaking to over the last two weeks, I suspect that it's been true for many years. He was comfortable being the person that he was. And that madrega of being comfortable in our own skin, of being comfortable being me, accepting myself, recognizing what I bring to the table, and confidently doing what I know HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave me to do. Moish mentioned the video about, about how to put on a talus. Anybody ever hear of another Rebbe that did that? Anybody? Anybody? Is there a Rosh Hashiva out there that has a how to put on a talus video? No. I am confident, as I knew him and as you knew him, I am confident that he did not second guess himself for an instant. For him, Rabbi Oberlander, this is who he was. This is what he gave. This was part of the broad role that he gave to Kalal Yisrael. He was comfortable. One of the Talmidim, one of his Talmidim mentioned to me, I think yesterday, that how many of us, I wonder how many people in this room have on their phones right now WhatsApps and voice notes from him. Some people in this room have hundreds of them. We were talking about, like, we should put out a WhatsApp book of all the WhatsApps. You know what that would be for Kalal Yisrael? All the WhatsApps that Rabbi Oberlander sent. It might have a few volumes, by the way. Do other Rabbeim do that? Is that a common thing? Do you think he questioned himself? I think in another yeshiva, the Rabbeim say that WhatsApp is Asr Midairaisa. One second. I'm, I'm, not saying, I'm not taking sides in, in what's, trust me, I don't, I'm, the last thing I care about right now. But, but, but for Rabbi Oberlander, this is what he knew his role, his Avedis Hashem, he stood by Ne'ilah and he davened into HaKadosh Baruch Hu with confidence. This is who he was. There was no wavering. There was no insecurity. There was no nervousness. There was no self-doubt. There was a certain miyushiv. Settled. Wasn't he settled? Settled. Calm. And in order to have that midah, there are two midahs that you need in order to have that midah. The first Mida that you need is the Mida of Anava. A person, I know it sounds like possibly a contradiction, but if you think deeply, you'll realize that it's the opposite. A person who's humble is able to look in the mirror, see who's there, and say, this is how I, I, me, the person that I am. This is how I am going to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I am comfortable with who I am, and I'm taking that to Klal Yisrael. And I'm te- making HaKadosh Baruch Hu proud. As they, all of us know how, much, how, how many times Rebbe would say about making Hashem proud. Humility. He was humble. I was realizing over the last two weeks just how many families were supported by him. I think like directly, there might have been, I think for sure upwards of 50, maybe even much more than that, that I, that I am aware of. Never said a word about it. It wasn't, had nothing to prove. There was a certain humility, a certain comfort in his role, in who he was, and that's something for us to learn from. 
And it's something that He tried to teach us, to believe in ourselves and to be comfortable with who we are. And the other mida that's necessary in order to be able to have that level of being comfortable with who we are is emuna. I trust HaKadosh Baruch Hu. HaKadosh Baruch Hu put me here. And I believe in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And I know that He loves me. And I know that He placed me in this role. And I am going to make Hashem proud. Hashem was real. And that's a mita that was so ingrained in Him. And it's certainly a credit, I have to say, it's certainly a credit also to His incredible parents who we, I watched over the last few weeks go through what must have been the most difficult time of their lives with such emuna. Ah, that's, that's that home. Yesterday we had a, a little gathering over Zoom with a bunch of couples from in Eretz Yisrael just for chizuk just to try to process what we're dealing with. And one of the guys said something so wise. He said, you know, people talk about, when someone is nifter, people talk about emulating that person and being like that person, taking on midas of that person. And I think, he said, he suggested, that the best way that I could emulate Rebbe is to be myself. Because Rebbe was himself. And if I try to be Rebbe, I'm not being like Rebbe. If I want to emulate him, it's for me to be grateful to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for what he gave me. And for me to take what he gave me forward in my life. And to give, and to, and to, to give to my mishpacha, and to give to the people, to my chaverim, and to take who I am. I want to just say over, this came up a lot of times over the last week. Some of you have heard me say this already. And I want to just say over this message that I think is crucial, especially to the Talmidim that feel like something is so, so missing in their lives. Some of us are wondering what the next step is in our lives. I'm going to sound a little chutzpahdik when I say this, and I hesitate to say it, but I want to say it strongly because Rabbi Oberlander would have wanted it to be said strongly. I am certain, as certain as I am of my own name, I am certain that he would want us to reaffirm together, to be makir, to realize together as the family that we are, that his message to us right now would be, you can do this. I believe in you. I know you can continue to grow without me. I know you can continue to make me proud and you can continue to make HaKadosh Baruch Hu proud. And I am certain that he, that I, I, I spent a lot of time with him as did so many of you, he had a tremendous sense of faith and belief in his Talmidim. He didn't didn't experience his type of Rebbe that he was. It was not like he felt like, ah, Mamash being Mechayim Mason, they would be dead without me. Maybe we feel feel that way sometimes. But he believed in the Kaychas of every Talmud. He He admired all of you. I know, because even without names, he would tell me about how much he admires this one and that one. He saw the Midas Teves that you have. He recognized the Kayach that you have to build beautiful, healthy families. And the way that we move forward is with the knowledge that Rebbe believed in us. And Rebbe knew that we can do this. And we can take this, we can take this journey forward. Maish just spoke, he ended off, he picked up his phone at the very end, and he read off what he had written about what he had learned, what the Oilam learned from Rabbi Oberlander. 
And my Kalish and I were looking at each other like, just, you know him. You know him, and if you know him, then he's still with us. You know his, you, you hear a Talmud get up and just say such true words. Such real, true words, exactly like Rebbe would say, down to the bedtime story. Every part of it. And that was not a joke, by the way. Every part of it was him. Moish spoke, he knew him. He was talking about someone that he knew. And you know what happens when you know someone? You can continue to hear his voice even when he's not here. You can continue to hear him say, thank you, thank you, thank you, when he hangs up the phone. You can continue to hear him say, okay, enough about me. How are you doing? You can continue to hear him say, let's continue to make Hashem proud. You can continue to hear him say, just be real. You can continue to hear his messages. You, this, this vart that Maish said about, about Ari Litzman, you understand we're talking about a room full of people and that's besides for whoever's not here in person, that are able to say, Rebbe would have said blank. What a matana we have. What a gift we have. We have, Rebbe is still with us, as long as we can say, Rebbe would have said. Anybody here that could think in their minds, Rebbe would have said, should know that he did not lose Rabbi Oberlander. Rabbi Oberlander is still with him. Because the message and the chizuk and the belief and the journey ahead, you're hearing the voice of your Rebbe. And that's the t- tremendous ashiras that you have. So while we're broken hearted, and it's going to take us a while, and we have to be patient with ourselves, we have to be patient with our spouses, those of us that are married, our spouses also lost a Rebbe. And we have to be patient as we go through this journey. And some days will be diff- more difficult and some days will be easier. But let's move forward knowing in our minds and our hearts that as much as the person that we so, so much enjoyed spending time with and that just spending a few minutes with this would, could give us a smile for the rest of the day, as much as we're going to miss that person, but we still have him as long as we can say Rebbe would have said. And we should be Zaycha. Until that day comes that HaKadosh Baruch Hu ends all the Tsaras of Klal Yisrael. We should be Zaycha. That we should be able to continue for the days, for the years, for the decades to come. To be able to make a Rebbe that we cherish so much proud. And to be able to make HaKadosh Baruch Hu proud. And to follow, to, 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 to lead on from here with a sense of Ashiras. We're broken, but we're broken Ashirim because we continue to carry the message of Rabbi Oberlander with us. Yashukayach.
I feel very lucky and very emotional to be part of such a chabura of people. Going through my thoughts and feelings, preparing what I want to say tonight, was extremely difficult for me, as I'm sure the last number of days has been for a lot of us. And I... I dive into Hashem that I adequately express the thoughts and feelings that I have. About 20 years ago, Rabbi Kalish took uh, his first trip to Eretz Yisrael to visit Talmidim. Rabbi Yitz probably remembers it. And Rabbi Kalish came back and taught us a line that to some may have been controversial. To Rebbe it was Pashid and it was um, very approved by Rav Nachum Kohn, if I remember correctly. That we don't strive for godless, we strive for shlemus. And by striving for shlemus, we reach godless. And that's the line that's been reverberating in my head the last number of days, thinking about Rabbi Oblander. That we saw godless, and that godless came from Shlemus. We saw somebody whose value of tefillah, and the importance of tefillah, and being timely to tefillah, engaging in tefillah, was so important. We saw somebody who exuded Amuna. He taught us about Amuna, he lived with Amuna, and in the last year and a half, we saw what came out in stressful times, things that can't be just spoken or, you know, done in order to just to teach the next person. It just, it, it was clear it's who he was. We saw somebody who was the importance of Shabbos. I didn't know this. Someone showed me on it. Uh, he has, in, in, each individual piece on the candelabra was labeled and he would prepare a different a different nair every day of the week as he looked forward to Shabbos as he taught us about Shabbos he loved Shabbos his midos were out of this world the calmness the 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 pleasantry the always looking proper and put together gentle and kind thinking about others the nice symbol Chaveiroi something that I don't I, I don't feel was given 
adequate attention and it makes sense to me that it wasn't because most of us knew Rabbi Oberlander from our perspective of recipients of his, his chesed, from his teaching us, from his involvement with us. But his asmada, his asmada was out of this world. Rabbi Sonnenschein told me that a number of years ago he was in Chaim Berlin and the mashkiach came over to him and he told him that when, when, when Avi Oberlander was here, we, wa- we wondered if there was a string attaching his forehead to the Gemara. I remember, I've heard from my Oberlander numerous times that his favorite Seder over the years was a Seder he shared with, with Reb Srili Gold. So it was very nice. I happened to know Srili, so I was very excited. What he neglected to tell me was that it was from after night Seder to two in the morning for three years. I was in his house, I think about five months ago, and he was learning with two of his close, close friends, and they were learning from Gemaras, and Rabbi Oblander was laying down, and it seemed like he was sleeping, or definitely very out of it, very weak at the time. And one asked a question, suddenly Rabbi Oblander pops up, answering and then a few minutes later, he says a ha'ara on the Gemara. But I, 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 I walked away from that night. I walked away. I went home and I sat and I learned for a while. Because where life will bring all of us, who knows? But I want to be that person. I want to develop myself into the person who's, who's a shtick taira. Who just, what comes out when, when there's not a lot left is just taira. He was able to be Isaac B'Tzarech Eitzibur with all of us because of the Torah, because of the Torah which he was Mekayim, the mitzvahs that he held in such high regard. That was his mission, the Limana Torah, the Kavarat Torah. My, my personal relationship with Rabbi Oberlander started a couple years before the Masifta. I was a uh, Bachar in Yeshiva. I wasn't too good in learning. And I would go to his house every morning and he gave me his time. I don't know why. <laughs> day after day for a number of months, I'd come before for a Seder to his house and he would sit with such patience. I butchered Gemara line after line after line and he would sit there with patience correcting me, giving me chizuk, urging me to continue. We became close friends, and he became a mentor to me in Rebbehood in many ways. When I wasn't sure to handle certain situations, especially the first time they arose, I would, I would call him up, I would ask him, I'd come over to him, and I'd say, what do I do? Do I do A, do I do B? About a year ago, last summer, I, um, I had a Talmud who for the first time that I've experienced that a Talmud going through an active divorce in his family. His parents were getting divorced. And we met up in Stamford, Connecticut. On my way, I did what I always do in such a situation. I called my Oberlander. Ask him, what, you know, what do I say? What do I do? What, how do I handle it? The message was the same as always, which many of us have heard, which has been said already tonight. The message was, trust your instinct. The message was, you know what to do. Just be yourself. That's all he needs. He needs you. That's why he reached out to you. Just instilling confidence. Giving strength to anybody around him. He did this to all of us, time after time after time after time. Rabbi Sonnenschein has taught us many times that the most important words in Chinuch is not I love you, it's I trust you. More than that, it's not just saying I trust you, it's actually trusting. For a father to tell his son, to tell his daughter, I trust you, to mean it, I trust you. For a Rebbe to tell his Talmud, I trust you. 
for a friend, to tell a friend, I trust you. At the Shiva, Moshe Oberlander expressed this, the trust that he was trying to give over a picture to his friends of who his father was. He was saying various things. He, he was pointing to pictures behind him. He said, we didn't put these pictures out of Talmidim because you know, people were coming to the house to show. These were always here. We thought this was normal. We thought it was normal to have pictures of Talmidim all around the house. He pulled out a stack of like, I think it was like 15 magnets of Talmidim. This was on our refrigerator. We thought this was normal. But he went on to say, he said, my father trusted us. I wanted to build a fence in the backyard. My father said, go for it. Build a fence. He's like, what father does that? (laughs) He trusted us. He put things in our hands and say, go for it. We wanted to do something. He was behind us. Rabbi Obalander's father, I guess, really taught us where Rabbi Obalander got it from. Because he told us that we just trusted him. We, We said we trusted Avi. We trusted him. He trusted him. He said he got up at his Afruf and he thanked his parents for not forcing him to go to college, which was the regular structure of the family. The kids went to college. He thanked him. He said, thank you for trusting me that it's not for me. I had a specific word I was trying to find from Amisha and um, I opened up the Sefer and the first thing I turned to wasn't that Vart, but it was the aside. So I took that as a sign. In Vayechi, Yaakov Avinu says, V'ata shnei vanecha anodim l'cha be'aretz, be'aretz Mitzrayim, abay elecha lihem. That Ephraim Menashe are mine. Like Reuven and Shimon, they're mine. The funny thing is, Marisha asks, you'd think the opposite. Of all the children who had the least shaykhs to Yaakov Avinu, of Yosef's, Ephraim and Menashe, they, they were born before he got to Mitzrayim. Any sons he had after they got to Mitzrayim, that would make sense that they have a close shaykhs. So Moshe says something that, that echoes the, the thoughts of son and Shine just mentioned, just focused on. He says... When a parent teaches a child, when a parent is mechanech, when a rebbe is mechanech, a child, the goal, or the, I should say, the realization of that goal, you don't see that realization when the rebbe or the father is around. Because who knows? That only does so much. But the goal is that the chinuch should be so strong, the ideals, the value system, the, the Ashkafas should be so implanted in the Talmud, in the child, that when the father or the Rebbe is not around, that that message carries through. He says, the godless of Yaakov's chinuch to Yosef was Ephraim and Menashe. They're mine. They're mine. Haraya, look at them. They're mine. It was through, it was through Yosef at Sadiq. That's a bigger raya than the children that came along later. It's the long game. It's, it, 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 it takes tremendous work and effort. But the goal is gam ki yazkin. The goal is the long term. And the chinuch was so strong within, within Yosef from Yaakov, it went to Ephraim and Menashe. The message Rabbi Sonnenschein gave us is this message that the effects of the Chinuch Rabbi Oberlander gave us by teaching us and just being around him and it was so fun to be around him it was so enjoyable to be around him but what he gave over to us in, in those times it was so powerful to all of us that it, we see it in our actions on a daily basis long before the Batira as Talmidim, as friends I say to us Talmidim, to us friends, I mean, Oblander gave us so much. He gave us a foundation for us to draw from. He gave us the inner world of Shabbos. 
He gave us the beauty of connection and chaverim. He gave us the truth of tefillah. He gave us the serenity of emunah. He gave us the importance of chabura. He gave us the sensitivity of marriage. For us, we must, we must make sure to touch base with one another, to be mechazik each other, to check in with each other. And we have to be thankful to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that we were so lucky that He put Rabbi Oban in our lives. We have to recognize that we are so fortunate to be around such a person. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give us the strength for each one of us to continue to do our, our voida, to do the best job of developing ourselves, our families, our talmidim, our friends, by being the best version of ourselves possible. And we beg HaKadosh Baruch Hu to please, please bring Mashiach so we can dance with our Rabbi again. Gathering like this is, is really hard. It's really hard um, for me. Um, I haven't I haven't looked back at my text messages. I haven't listened back at my, to my voice notes. Um, it's like it's it's hard to um, it's hard to process every time. You know, I'm not I'm not. I know there are people that that get for me. It's hard to to open up a magazine and I'm not I, I can't do it yet. It's really hard for me. Um, at the same time, I think there's no there's no better way um, to deal with tragedy than to de- to deal with these types of things than by gathering together. So thank you, thank you, Rabbi Sunshine Rebbe, thank you, Maish. Um, I did write down a few things. It's hard it's hard to um, to 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 try to emote something that you wrote down. I'm gonna I'm gonna try my best to to give over the message that I'm feeling. Um, I think I, I speak for myself, but I feel like um, many people could identify, could feel this, feel the same way. Um, it's one thing to lose a Rebbe. I don't, I don't, I don't want to be cliche. I'm not trying to be cliche. This is, I, I genuinely feel that I, I lost more, more of a close friend than a Rebbe. Like, he obviously was my Rebbe, but he was also one of the best friends that I had. Um, and it's really hard. Probably that's why he was my Rebbe, I'm assuming, is, is because he was my best friend. I, I observed the Rebbeim in Durham. I think a lot of the ways the Rebbeim in Durham show up is, is what they learned from Rabbi Oberlander, is, is to be there as a human being for someone else, to connect to them. And yeah, and then not, you're not trying to like scam them in. No, then, then they want it. They want to they they connect. They want to understand. Um, I want to share something similar to, to Rabbi Sonnenschein. Rabbi Sonnenschein was sharing more of the perspective, I guess, of someone who's... I want to share my own experience. Um, something that I... One thing, one thing that I... That, that really speaks to me and spoke to me and speaks to me, something that I live with. Um, a few years ago, about ten years ago, Rabbi Oberlander told me, uh, told me a word. I don't think he ever said it in a shir. I don't he told it to me personally over the phone. Um, looking back at the time I thought, oh cute, nice art. It took me a little bit of time to understand. 
Um, he told me about a conversation he had with, um, with some, he went to visit a big rabbi and, and, and uh, the rabbi was telling him, you know, how do you, uh, how do you teach children to connect, Talmudim to connect to tefillah? Um, and the person, the, the rabbi answered him, I think this is the way, the guy, this is what I remember. He told him that the way that you teach someone to connect to tefillah is if you tap into tefillah, if you connect to tefillah. Then people around you, you'll overflow, they'll connect to it as well. And, um, Stam, if you've seen Rabbi Oberlein de Davin, you know. Um, but um, but the, the rabbi then gave him a raya. He told him the raya is, is that when Lot was parting from, when Lot decided that, that he went, he, he made the decision to, to travel away. He said, um, uh, Rashi says, um, That Lot's whole connection, you see, I don't want Avram and I don't want his God. You see that Lot's entire connection um, was what, to, to Hashem was through uh, was, was through Avram, and that's what he told me that that the rabbi told him. And then like he left, and on his way home, he's like, one second, it, Lot Avram that that messed, that failed. He booked like Lot left. What do you mean? That's a, that's the connection. That's a mistake. Then then they did something wrong. So Rabbi Overlander told me, and this is what he he called me to tell me, um, is that is that the problem you see in the pesukim? A lot of times it says that. That Lot did things just because that's how he saw Avram do it. Is that he was a Talmud of, of, of Avram Avinu, but he didn't, he didn't take it and, and make it his own. He didn't bring himself. He didn't bring Lot to the picture. Um, I want to tell two, two personal stories. They're not the biggest stories. It's just to me these are stories that, that um, I think bring out the point. Stories that, the big stories are the stories that you remember vividly. Usually I think that's how it works. Like if you can remember a story in, in, uh, in vivid detail, it means that it, it had an impression on your life. Um, I had a period of time where I was um, I was in Eretz Yisrael and I was I was looking for for um, for validation for you know I wanted people to see that I was doing well and I I would you know I uh, I came back I looked like really intense you know I showed up you try to carry as many svarim as you can you know haul it into the basement just hope that someone sees you um, and I remember didn't we we hung out we didn't say the next year I I, I was able to. I became more comfortable with myself, and there's, you know, and I came back and I, I think I looked a little bit more calm. And he, the first thing he said to me, like he leaned over, he's like, "Phew, you had me worried." Um, that's one story. Another story is that um, there was a time, as Chatay ani Maskeriyim, there's a time that uh, that if I slept through Shachis, I'd have a hard time with first Seder. I'm sure some of us have been there before. For some reason, if you sleep through, that means like your whole day is, your whole day is gone. So I went over to Rabbi Overland, and I was like, I was, I was, came back, I was in, I was like, I was in Beis Medrash, I was this big mashpia guy, you know. And I said, yo, Rebbe, I slept through Shachas. He's like, Chesk, I'm so proud of you. And he meant it, he meant it. I didn't even know what he was saying. I didn't. But, but to me, there was something there. As someone who's, who a lot of my life, I've, I've, I've tried to do things for other people, to impress other people, to get, um, to get acceptance from others. Um, to have someone, firstly, Rabbi Overlander for me, was the most calming person in the world. You have like, you have the most emotional reactions, and he's like there, just like, okay, that's normal. Let's talk. Like we could talk it through. This is something that you could handle. It's like just for me, was one of the most, the most calming people. You could turn to him with anything that's like freaking you out, and he, he was there to like, oh, it's okay. Um, but more is that if there's a voice in my head that 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 I could say to myself today, like Chesky, you're good, you're okay. Um, that voice, one of the first people that ever, that ever spoke that voice into existence was Rabbi Oberlander. Um, said, Chesky, you're the one. We need you, like, like how you are. Not, not, you don't need to be someone else. Be yourself. Um, and, and I think that, that that type of, I don't know where, for sure it comes from a place where a person's very, very, very okay with themselves, like Rabbi Sonnenstein was saying. You could then look at someone else and say, like, no, no, you could be yourself. You could be okay being yourself. Um, and that's really... Um, for me, that's like uh, that's something that I that I use a lot in, in circumstances where I, I get insecure or I get I question myself. You know, I I talk to myself. I say, Chesky, you got this. You're okay. Um, how you perform at this speech that you're giving doesn't change who you are as a person. You're a good person, um, and I think that if all of us can internalize that message. Um, if all of us could internalize the message that we're okay, we're okay how we are, we're good. Uh, we have our own kochos, our own things that we could bring out to the world. When we're so okay with ourselves, we could give it to our spouses, we could give it to our children, we could give it to our friends. Um, 
the last thing I'd like to say is if, if Mrs. Oberlander is listening, I, I know for myself, um, your home became for me a, a home away from home. For some people, it became a home. Um, and I know that it, you know, when I was a kid, we had no clue. You like show up at someone's house, like eat all the food they have, and you like, <laughs> you think it's normal. And then you, you start your own home, and it's like, it's not the same. It's not, it's, it's, it's hard to understand how, um, how someone could have, could have, how you guys, how you, you guys let us into your lives. And um, thank you so much for giving us your husband. I'll miss him. I'll miss him a lot. Like 10 years ago, I remember it was Shabbos and Heller, Rabbi Sun and Shine, Rabbi Kaylee, she used to give a shir, a chinuch shir. And uh, I remember one time Rabbi Sun and Shine spoke, and he was saying, he was in the middle of a case, and he said that a Talmud of his called him, and he said, that he's not sure he's going through financial problems, Shalom Bayez problems, somebody bought him tickets to a baseball game with his whole family. But he also was maybe that night going to go, I think, take his wife out. Like they, you know, they were going through some rough kufa and they were going to go together that night. And he didn't know what to do. And he called Rabbi Sun and Shine and he called him on Friday and it was Shabbos in camp and Rabbi Sun and Shine said, I didn't get a chance to call him back, and he was talking about this idea that you know a person has to learn in life how to make decisions and how to you know develop yourself, and your Rebbe won't always be there holding your hand. And Rabbi Sanjay said, "I'm going to call him Motzei Shabbos, but I'm not going to give him an answer to his question. I'm going to make him understand what to do." And it had such an effect on me. I remember at the time it was almost like. It was such a shocking thing for me to hear that there's a guy, I was maybe 17, 18, I don't remember. And I remember that thinking to myself, wow, there's a guy who's going through a real, you know, situation. And he's not sure what to do. You know, I wasn't happy with the bunk they put me in. I wanted to switch. And this guy is married. He's having issues. And somebody gave him money to go to a game. And his kids love baseball. And he called his Rebbe. Like, what else are you supposed to do? And his Rebbe is not even going to give him an answer. I remember, until today, I remember, I don't know if I got all the details right, but it had such a, you know, strong effect on me. And I want to just point out one Nakuda with, you know, Rabbi Oberlander. And I want to just focus on this one thing to take out, you know, for the rest of my life and share an experience. I'm seeing so many faces from so many different years. It's just unbelievable to see there's like at least 13 years of alumni in here, and I think we all feel the same. And so, I, I'm the oldest in my family. I never had an older brother. And really when I met Rabbi Oberland, there was the first time in my life that I understood what that relationship looks like. Just somebody who's just, he's been there right before you were there, and he knows what to tell you, and he could just filter out the situation for you. And, you know, I met him in 11th grade, and uh, we got closer and closer over the years. And I would like to share the following Dvar Torah. Right before Avad Yosef passed away, it's actually a live interview, you can see, but they spoke to him, and he gave over the message which he charged all the Rabbanim with his whole life. And his motto that he held for Rabbanus, he really gave it over. He was already weak, but he said it over to the person interviewing him. And he said that the motto of a Rav should be, what we say in Pirkei Ava, is that you should be a Talmud of, you know, Hillel says, to be a Talmud of our own. Shalom, Shalom, Sabrias, and Makarvan Latira. That's what we're supposed to do. 
And my question is, you know, the Mepharshim ask, why does it say be a Talmud of Aaron? Just say be Ayah Shalom, Raid of Shalom, love people and, and bring them back. What is it, what's the message behind this idea of be a Talmud of Aaron? It's a cute idea to say I'm a Talmud of this Rebbe, I'm a Talmud of that Rebbe, but to say be a Talmud of Aaron in, in a Mishnah and Pirkei Avos sounds like almost something that's just, you know, more of a cute idea as opposed to something practical. And if we look into Aaron, we'll see that he had a very unique way of doing Kirov. His way of doing Kirov, we have two instances where we know he did Kirov. When people were having Shalom bias problems or when, you know, people got into a fight. How did Aaron solve the problem? Aaron went in there. He went into the situation and he was talking to one person about what the other person was saying, that the other, other person feels so bad that he spoke like this about you or he did this to you. And then he would go to the other person and almost when we're kids it sounds like this like funny thing, like what, they were that naive to think that my neighbor who I'm in a fight with for five years feels so bad? But you see that the genius of Aaron Akain, that he was able to obviously get into a situation where there's a fight and these are the most complicated situations that happen amongst people and really convince the other side that the other person really loved them. And another thing we know is that Aaron Akoyan would befriend people who were up to no good, and eventually they would say to themselves, you know, I'm friends with Aaron Akoyan, it's pretty embarrassing for me to be doing X, Y, and Z, and through that he elevated them. So he had a very unique approach, Aaron Akoyan. It wasn't through shiurim or through, you know, different situations, but it was really through going into the bottom and really being there with the people in the situation. When I think about Rebbe, I think of this idea. You know, the word Hevra, we all know. How much did Rabbi Oblan say the word Hevra? And how much of, you know, this has been said so many times, but again, this is just my perspective. How many times have we been with him in situations that are not Rebbe situations, quote-unquote? Literally, I was just talking to... I, Two people were telling me this week stories when they got pulled over with him. What happened? You know, everyone had so many different stories that happened with him that were not necessarily, you know, Rebbe moments. That he, oh, did you hear the Vard that Rabbi Oberlander said about this thing? And now we're going to have to change our lives around. He validated us and he was with us and he held our hand. The name that we all you know, knew him by in our heads, you know, was Obi. I know right now, you know, it's, you know, some people are wondering, you know, it's like, you know, do I call him that? Or do you say we're going to Obi's, you know, whatever it is, or Robert Oberlander, you know, I see like a confusion. And for me, and for so many of us, the name Obi, think about what that name is synonymous with for you. It's clarity, confidence, you know, validation, that you matter. That's what that name meant to us. Let's go to Obi's house. Let's call Obi. It was such a staple in people's home or amongst guys in yeshiva dating. What should we do? Call Obi. Text Obi. I don't know. Ask Obi. We took it for granted that we just had somebody that you can always call no matter what and he was such a chacham that he didn't necessarily have to go through what you went through to tell you what to do. And he was so clear that even if sometimes... Sometimes I didn't, I find myself not even needing to call him because I knew what he's going to say. And if I really took a minute to think about the situation, I know what he's going to tell me to do. And there's not, you know, a single, you know, chevra, chabura, I call it a crew of guys in yeshiva over the years that he wasn't part of. Think about the different, you know, groups of guys we remember in, throughout the years in Waterbury. There was not a single chevra that he wasn't a part of in, in, a, in a way that he was a friend of ours. You know, uh, me and my close friends, you know, Moish, uh, Berkey, Mayer, Ari, we were such a tight knit. We've been together for, you know, 13 years, going strong, that we've been like brothers to each other. And he was really one of that with us. I remember, you know, Friday night, Oinig sleeping by his house every Friday night. I don't think he. Single hand, you can count on one hand how many times he missed a Friday night meal in yeshiva. And walking back to his house in the you know cold Waterbury nights, 
and sleeping by him and him waking us up to the smell of coffee to go to Shachar's with him. And, you know, it was my job, and I'm sure it was many people in this room's job after me, to hold the, ch- the crock pot Friday night when he made a huge crock pot. And, you know, recently I thought about it. It was so him that he made a huge crock pot, and whatever was left was for his family the next day. He didn't make two separate crock pots. He made the huge 22 quart that he was proud of, that he had to get bigger and bigger crock pots over the year, and whatever was left was for his family. And some weeks it was close. I remember him saying, okay, hey, we're not going to fill this one to the top because then... You know, if somebody's not going to have children tomorrow. And I, it, some weeks it got really close. And, the, you know, leaving the kishka over is a chachma. There's a reason why he only took one guy to the back. <laughs> and I remember that when that room was busting from the oinigs and the, you know, every Friday night almost, somebody would hit the light off, the switch. There's always someone backed into the light every Friday night, and he loved it. Because that's when he started singing kayak life, and that's when everyone really got into it. And, you know, until eventually he extended the room... I actually bought him a magnet, the Shabbos magnet that he still has to, for that. I'm not sure if he was being nice to me or he, you know, he still wanted somebody to shut it off. But he definitely took it and was appreciative. And, um, you know, Israel Shabbos, how many guys did he pay for to have hotel rooms in Israel on the, you know, on the Water Bay Alumni Shabbosim? For why? For what reason? You know, and, like, and you think about it more and more as you know, we think about him not being around. The only nechama, you know, that I have is that I know that it was so clear what he was about and it was so clear what he was to us in our life. And I know that although the last year and a half was a little bit of a vague, you know, pause for a lot of us on having him around, but I know that just the fact that what he stood for, and we, no one here, you know, we, were all, we all are in the middle of a few shilas that we were going to ask him. But nobody here feels... Like, oh, I wish he knew this thing about me I never told him. Or I wish I could have spent a little bit more time with him. Everyone here felt like they did get enough of him, and that he did give us enough of himself. And that's what I felt like was the biggest thing for me. You know, driving to my, coming to my l'chaim, driving two hours from my l'chaim, when he's coming to the vart anyways, and the wedding. My brother had a COVID wedding. He drove in from Waterbury just to take him to go to pictures because he couldn't come to the wedding because he was a little bit more cautious with COVID because of what happened to him. So he drove in from Waterbury, took my brother from the Five Towns to Brooklyn, and went straight home. He didn't cheap out on, you know, I'm not going to the wedding, I'll take it off today. He came and he showed you with actions that you matter and what you're going through matter. And that's the idea, which is going back to answer what it means to be a Talmud of Aaron. That's why the Mishnah tells you that you need to be a Talmud of Aaron, because if you think that you're just going to love people and be nice to people and smile at people and be patient with people, that's not going to necessarily get them to be Kar of Latayra. That's not going to you know, develop into what we see here. If you're a Talmud of Aaron, and then you go into that job, if you say that no matter what fight that person is going through, I'm in that fight, and I'm in the details. And, I'm, and you, you're a little question, and you're not sure what to do, and you're not sure if to get... You know, to move to this apartment or that apartment, to pay more rent here, to move out of town, nothing felt like it was too little for him to deal with. And that was Aaron. He got into the details with us. And that was Rebbe. And I'll leave off just uh, as a nechama, the famous Yaivitz in Brachas, when it deals with the sugyas of do the deceased people know what's going on after they go, the Yaivitz famously says, that anybody who on this, in this world was involved with people, in Shemaim, they allow him to stay involved with those people. And, you know, there's no bigger nechama for me and for a lot of us here to know that no matter where you go, no matter what you do, you know, Rabbi Oberlander has permission in Shemaim to stay in touch with you, to stay involved with you. If you ever need anything, go to his caver, you know, go ask him, do something for his neshama, and he'll always be there for us, just like he was in this world. And, uh, yeah. We'll sing the Kayak Seif song that many, many of us, almost all of us, have sung many, many times with Rabbi Oblander. It is Lel Shishi. Let's sing the Kayak Seif. After Kayaksite, for literally 10 minutes, we're going to ask guys from the main beach. Uh, just share everybody's speaking recollections, the bracha, 
a word anybody's invited. I have like at 10.35, 10.40, I'd like to see for five minutes to close, and we're going to try to end by about 10.45. Oh, sure. Probably doing one of the guys who sings nice. Who's that makes you dub it. Dub it sings very nice. Where is he? Dub it. Dub it. Who's dub it? Who's dub it? Singer. Dub it. Yeah. All right. Start over here. All right. Yeah, put this hold. This. Go ahead. Start. He said very nice. Make us proud. You, you want to start Kyle outside? Yeah. 
Um, I just want to, before I say very a few, sh- before I say a few short words, I just want to first of all thank um, Rabbi Son and Rabbi Kalish for coming and Greeny David Liff for um, putting this together for everybody. Um, uh, we all need it, and uh, I appreciate everyone who took care of it. So I'm not going to say any chedushim. Uh, you know, we have, we all have stories. We all have. Um, beautiful memories but it's not about me and everyone could get up here and speak the whole night but I, I think one question that we all have is how do you f- fill such a void in your life for a person who wore many hats to you a Rebbe, a father a friend a life coach, a therapist, a marriage counselor, I mean Everyone who had a relationship with with Rebbe, like he was, he was a one-stop shop. I mean, right? There's no way around it. So, like, where do we go from here? I don't have an answer. But um, one thing I, I I was thinking while I was listening to all the beautiful people who spoke um, was something that Rebbe sent to me in the beginning of COVID, right in the beginning of quarantine when no one really knew what was going on, but we, were, we all knew it was something serious and that um, we were all going to not be together for some time. Um, he, Rabbi sent me a voice note to the Chabura with three points, and I think two of them, they're all applicable now, but I want to share two of them that maybe can somewhat answer the question. Um, the first one was that We don't really know what's going on, 
And I, I even wrote down so I don't, I don't want to misquote. But Rabbi said, Be'ezus Hashem, this matzif will pass, whatever this matzif is. But what should scare us is if it passes and we're the same people. It will pass, but what about us? Rabbi said that we should take something on, be macabre something. It should be something small, something realistic, something personal to us. Um, but it should be something, each person their own way, something that, work, that works for you and has meaning to you. And the second thing was to be mechazik nar tefilas, um, that this matzif that we're all going through, and it was very like eerie to hear like, you know, Rebbe's own voice saying like, I don't know when we'll be together again. Like those were his words, and to hear Rebbe say like, you know, that we should be mechazik nar tefilas, and this matzif is from Hashem, it's part of, our, part of the journey. And it's something that he created, tailored for us. And we need to turn to him. From him, we have to turn to him for guidance and help and to daven. And then at the end, there's one more point, but he said we you know, left up with a bracha that we should, the world should return to normal. Um, normal should, be, should not be the way it was, but we should be bigger and better people from the matzav. So... Okay, that was maybe, you know, that's comforting to some people to go through this matzif. Like, you know, obviously, Hashem, everything's from Hashem. And if Rebbe didn't ask why for the last 18 months, then none of us have a reason to ask why. I mean, that's obvious. Um, but one thing that I think I'm speaking for myself brings me comfort, and I'll, I'm going to end with this, but, you know, the last 18 months, those of us who spoke to Rebbe every day, who didn't get to speak to Rebbe, Rabbi Sunshine touched on the, the Leviah, it's been, it was very hard. And there were many questions that we wanted to ask. Uh, every difficult decision went, went straight to Rabbi Oberlander, and we couldn't. But one thing that I always knew, all those of us who grew up in his house, the Onegs, the Chaburas, but really was like solidified in me the last 18 months, was that you can learn everything that you need to know just from watching Rabbi Oberlander, watching the way he's a husband to the Rabbitson, watching the way he's a father to his children, how he's a Rebbe teach one of us, how he goes through every minute of his life, every minute of his journey was accounted for. And, you know, it brings me some type of comfort knowing that I had this chus, and we all did. It doesn't matter if you knew Rabbi Oberlander for 20 years, a year, five years, or if you just watched him from afar in yeshiva. But the fact that we all had this chus to watch how he went about his life and took every single challenge and every part of his journey with such a beauty, such a, a thought out process, really gives me the knowledge that I have the foundation to go through whatever lays ahead. I don't know what lays ahead, I don't have an answer for how we're going to fill this void, but I know that if you're a Talmud of Rabbi Oberlander, it's in you. It's in you, he knows it was in you, he believed in you, like we all keep saying. And we just have to go back and replay all the memories, replay all the Shabbosim together, the Chaburas. But he gave it to us. And we just have to follow that. And like someone said, what would Rebbe do? The fact that we can ask that, that's the only way we're getting through day to day. And Emer Hashem will continue through all our lives, raising our children, building our homes, Shaduchah, marriaging, wherever you're up to. But um, Emer Hashem will, will be together with Rebbe very soon by Mashiach. Thank you, Zando. Um, wow. Obviously, a lot of people spoke tonight. We all came in here tonight not knowing like exactly what the schedule was and how many people were going to speak. But the truth is, I think everybody could speak over here. I think every single person could speak. And just the fact that anybody could get up there and speak is just a testimony in itself as to what Rebbe was for us, was, was to each and every person. Um, obviously, people have been listening for a long time. I'll try to just say something short. I just want to start off by saying that, um, obviously, over the last year and a half, um, the, the fact that Rebbe wasn't well wasn't, wasn't spread, wasn't really known about 
you know, for a while. And here and there, someone would find out something, something find, find out something's going on. And I'll tell you, when I like, spoke to Rebbe this past summer after <coughs> I got engaged and I came to, I came to Woodlake to, to see him right afterwards. And, you know, we had some Mechaims together. And I heard a little bit what was going on with him. Obviously, he was vague, you know. I heard a little bit what was going on. And after a couple of months, like, even when a, a friend would find out something, like, I wasn't sure, like, what do we do? Like, how do we, what do we do with this? Like, how do we deal with what's happening right now? Like, it's not spread. Should we say to Hillam? Should we, like, what should we do? And, like, it's hard to, like, know what to do. And, like, not a lot of people know, like, what, like, how do you deal with this? Like, what do we do about this? And I just want to thank Zundel for really, and Moish and whoever was involved with just starting a Tehillim chat and starting with uh, everybody say, saying whatever kapital they could say every single day, whatever they took, and finishing Sefer Tehillim every single day for months, and just putting that together, just to, just to put action into it, and just to be able to like, take initiative and to put something together and just build a connection with the guys and what, and what we're doing about it was like amazing. Thank you Zondel for that. Um, and I know people were just involved financially, people were involved whenever there was money. I, I know Mayor Kalevsky was involved and like just people that just took initiative and took like, like I want to get involved however I can and whatever I can do and whatever my part I can take. And just amazing just to see the people that jumped on it like jumped on things to do for Rebbe, like the second, it's, it's, it's incredible. Just to give over something quick, I don't, you know, I don't want to take up the rest of the time over here, but just, just to give over like my last conversation with Rebbe, the literally conversation in text, not on WhatsApp anymore because it was like six months ago, he wasn't really WhatsApping, it was much more like text. I wasn't sure even to like reach out to him because I wasn't sure what he was doing, but he kept, ask, he kept asking me how I'm doing. And like, it was so interesting. I'm getting like a text from him, Svi, how are you? And like, what do I do with that? Like, how am I? Like, I know, I know he's not well. Like, how am I? He keeps asking me how I'm doing. Like every couple of weeks you reach out, how are you? And it was one night that he asked me how I'm doing. And I actually had a question, a classic Rabbi Overlander question. And like, I'm not sure if it was Guy that spoke this out, like, and everybody's been speaking this out. Just like, there was no question that was too small for him. Like, a lot of questions that you wouldn't go to other people for, like, you're going to go to him. Because he's just, everything's a question. Like, you bring it up to him, like, everything's a serious conversation. Like, let's talk about it. Let's talk through it. Like, let, let, it's something that you feel safe. You feel safe in front of, he's somebody that you feel safe in front of. Any, any sort of question that comes up, big, small. And it happens to be like that night. I was married for like a month. My wife had a wedding in Lakewood. And I wasn't sure, should I take her to the wedding? I don't know, like, what's my role? Am I supposed to take her to the wedding? She's okay going by herself. She doesn't need me to take her. Like, what am I supposed to do? Like, what's the right thing to do over here? So I just asked him, you know, after he asked me how I'm doing, I just said, like, I told him what's going on. Even though knowing, like, I don't even know if he's, like, in bed now. Like, I don't know what, I don't know what his situation is right now. But, like, he keeps asking me. So, like, and now I have a question. So let me ask him. And... He just sends me back. This is literally like my last text from him was was explana was a uppercase taker with explanation points. And then he wrote after that the next text was it's yours chus explanation point. And like it was just like I was just like whoa like okay and like my wife didn't know like I already had told her like I don't think I'm gonna take it. Then I called her back and I said I think I, I thought about it and like I just <laughs> I feel like you know. It's the right thing to do. Like, I really want to take you, whatever. And, but like, it was just like, sometimes when you just have that mindset, your mindset's just so off, and like, you get that text. Like, I got that text from him. It wasn't just like a text. It was just like, it was a shout. It was like, uh, hello, get your head on straight. Like, what are you doing? And that was like my last words. Like, I, the last words I got from him, you know? And it was something that I, I took, I took from him, obviously, the small questions, the big questions, someone that was just with you every step of your life, no matter what you're going through. Any stage I was in my life, he was involved always. And I could say for myself, and I'm sure everybody can, and Rebbe, we're going to miss you. We do miss you already. And in Hisham only have an Aliyah.
Is he recorded? What do you thought this? Somebody there. <sighs> okay. I asked if I could say something. Um, I wasn't Zoycha to have the closest relationship to our Lander. Um, I got a lot of chizik, obviously, like everybody, from every time just passing him in the hall and that kind of, and just interactions like that. It was always someone who you felt imbued with a certain strength and confidence, um, and a lot of what's being said is resonating. I want to share just for 30 seconds, quickly, just a slightly different the perspective I had of, and the appreciation I have that I got to be part of the Tkufa that Robo Lander was, you know, was part of Yeshiva. Um, I think staff kids and like the kids that grow up around something sometimes have a very pure, real perspective on what they're seeing. They don't know anything grander. It's what they're, it's what they're growing up with, and they a lot of times get to the core of it. Sometimes you could really tap when you spend hours running around, fighting with guys, getting in trouble. You could really get a, you know, you really tap into kudo of what's going on. Um, I didn't have. Quickly, my, I didn't have the easiest, um, let's say, elementary school experience. I remember a lot of days, like, after Hebrew, walking over to the Masifta. And I want to express my appreciation to what was happening at that point. And the Chavri here, um, like, I saw, let's say, Zevi Rubin in D.C. tonight. And, like, if I had to encapsulate my 6th, 7th, and 8th grade years, it was like I remember D.C. and Zevi taking me to the city one night after school. And like there was a sense, and I got to be part of something. I got to see something, and there was a sense we had those years that we were part of something that was a secret that nobody else knew about, and it was better than anybody else could imagine. Um, and I still feel that way. And there was a lot of yeah. Um, I think that Waterbury is a place that always is muhad, and that Waterbury could say I love you to a person like almost nowhere else in the world. And what I'm understanding tonight is that Oberland, there was someone who could say, I trust you to somebody like, like no one else in the world. And without opining on which one of those two things is more important, I think the combination that exists to them was magical. Um, I think the echoes are still very, very loud. And I feel very, very lucky to have gotten to see that and be a part of that. And I want to express appreciation to the Chavra and to what Oberland was part of the building. Thank you. Right after, a few weeks after the October 7th tax, uh, tax that were happening in Israel, I came home and I saw like a safer on the, on the dining room table, an English safer on Chavez. And I asked my wife, like, what is this? Where did this come from? And she said that Rebbe sent it to us. I'm like, I never asked him for it. She's like, yeah, I did. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? She's like, yeah, I, I reached out to Rebbe to see what we can do, what we could take on, like, with everything going on in our throw. And, like, like, it was that moment like, I'm realizing, like, how many people can say that where the... They have a relationship. The, the wife, my wife, had a relationship with Rebbe. You know, Rebbe gave himself over not only to his Talmidim, but his Talmidim's, Talmidim spouses. It, like, it was, for me, it's mind-boggling. Like, and, I, and I found out even more so how much, not only did I lose, my, my wife lost. How much she was relying on Rebbe Lubanda, how much we were re- relying on Rebbe Lubanda. I, I think also, like, a big, big realization for me was... When, when after Rebbe died, after Rebbe passed away, um, something that hit me so, like so deep, was I was at work the next day after the Levaya, and someone asked me why I'm down. And obviously I was taken back a little bit, and I said, you know, I just lost my Rebbe. You know, we, we, we just lost our Rebbe, someone who we were, was obviously more than a Rebbe to us. And the, the person couldn't understand it. You know, and not to compare Chas Hashem, it's more... Just understand, like, we, we, we can't even fathom, like, what we lost. Someone that, you know, it was, it's, it's been said so many times, someone that he wasn't just a Rebbe. He was our Rebbe, who was our best friend, our mentor, someone we, we chilled with, someone we had fun with, someone we learned with. It was, you know, 
someone we obviously someone we lost it was it was more than a Rebbe I think just you know everyone we're all saying this how we can continue how we can go on what we can do obviously I don't have the answers but just something that I think about going back to every conversation that I had with our Bobo and there any text any voice message I think that any any time there was an issue in my life, anytime I had a problem, anytime I had a question, and I asked Rabbi like what to do, it was never really like oh do this, don't do this. It was never like a yes or no. It was always a life lesson. It was always like a, a lesson. He didn't just tell me like okay do this. It was more like okay let's talk about it, let's figure it out, let's dissect the situation. I think like if we go back, we realize like he really taught us how to take each situation individually. We taught us how to live life to its fullest, but also like figure out like when you're having an issue, when you're having a problem, we could really figure it out on our own in a sense. We really have, we have those lessons instilled in us. Yeah, so thank you. I had this thought like after the Levaya and like a couple days after that when you read like books about Gedolim you see like always at the end it says like or sometimes you'll hear like you know uh, the person the author or somebody who's involved in the publish in the publishing of it say like as much as the book and the story speak about the person like you don't actually like he was much more than that like it doesn't speak you know truth to what it, to what he actually was as a person like I always thought it was like a cute like cheap thing it's like oh like you know nice like but like like what does it actually mean and I never actually felt that real feeling until until now um, I think one like unique thing that stuck out about the different aspedim and different stories that were told that the shiva and after and just amongst the guys was that there were so many different like points of view and different relationships and connections that everybody had with the Roverlander and um, there's one story in my mind that speaks out just to give an example of that and it happens to be I remember when Rebbe had said uh, the other week that we want to have this get together we want to be like a little bit light also so I'm just going to share like a story that just shows like Rebbe Roverlander also knew how to like as the guy said like really like chill with the guys and he was like as much as he was Rebbe he was our, our father and our friend and our mentor and so much more but like how we knew each guy and what they needed at each time was like incredible. And I remember just in 12th grade, it was Shavuos, and um, it was second day Shavuos, and there's no laning by Mincha. And it was right after Ashrei, and the Roblander looked at me, gave me a wink, like they say, like, watch this. And he goes over to one of the guys, the Chevra, as he, as he would call it, and one of like the, you know, fun guys with personality, and he asked him, do you want to do Psicha? And the look on the guy's face, like he just like lit up, and he's like, he puts on like a talus, and he runs over and he just whips it open, and he turns around to see everyone taking three steps back, and the Rebbe was looking at him with like a smile, and it spoke a lot about his sense of humor. Now he knew how to like, you know, which guy to pick and to to do that too, and also afterwards how he went over to him and some of the guys, and he was like, was I wrong for doing that? Like was was that too much? Like. The sensitivity was also there, like at the same time. Um, whatever Sunshine had said before about how guys are able to see, like, you know, what would Rebbe say and what would Rebbe do in this situation, I never, in a way, felt so, like, broken and whole at the same time. How already, like, a couple of months, you know, before we weren't able to be in touch with Rebbe as much as we were before that. Um, I would just start thinking to myself, like, what would Rabbi Oberlander say in this situation, in this time, in this matzav, in this situation? 
and at the same time knowing like having that confidence because he instilled that in me what to do and how to do it and in a way like I don't know I'm sure I speak for a lot of us when I say this but like there's so many times where I just came with like a billion questions and like in a second like clarity was just like came out like okay like life like he just simplified it in such a special way and like I feel like just another point like Rebbe was like a really special tzaddik and like he lived with Kedusha in the most simple way and it wasn't about being from it wasn't about being like a stark guy like that didn't like mean much it was about just being like a good person about being like a a good yid a good family man a good person a good friend a good harusa a good roommate whatever it is like whatever whatever situation each one was in at that time like it was about being the best you and like everything like just watching who he was as a person was also just like looking like you know you see someone living like so simple but so like you know like in touch with Hashem and just close with you know with Hashem as a year like at the same time it was just special to see and um, back to that point like what with, with uh, what Rabbi Sunshine had said about like just thinking like what would Rabbi do like that clarity that he gave over to all of us like in you know each smart stuff in life Again, like it's so broken and whole at the same time. How we're able to just like, I you know feel him being there because I know he's there, you know, with all of us through each time. And at the same time, like knowing what Rebbe would do, because like it wasn't about like he took the most complicated things and made them the most simple. Because it was just about doing the right thing. It wasn't more than that. It wasn't like how you would look and how you might someone might see. And like it was about just doing the right thing, and everything else would fall into place. And shall be zeichet to just carry on his legacy and just you know, continue making him proud and like he would tell us making Hashem proud as well. I remember when I first came to Waterbury in 12th grade, it was the middle of the year, it was Hanukkah time, and after Shachris, after breakfast, I saw everyone branching off to two different groups. One was to Revezi, to the famous Revezi al Hashir. The other was to Rabbi Oberlander's Halacha Chabura. And something I noticed, that nothing was ever called a shir. It was always a chabura because we're always going to learn it together because it's not me teaching you. It's always let's you know I'm I'm you know let's let's try to figure it out together. Even though we all know the Masechet Talmud Chacham Rebbe was, but nothing was ever called a shir. And I sit down to this year, to the chabura, and I think we were learning Hilchos Kriyashima. And somehow it comes up for the first time I hear Vishinatol Vanecha. Rebbe says Chazal Darshin Rashi Darshin Zeil Tamidim. I said, it's a cute vart, it's nice, you know. I don't think I've heard it before. And, uh, you know, and, and, and Rebbe said, your sons, your Talmidim are your sons. And over the past eight, nine years, not only did I see someone live that way, but someone who really embodied and meshed that into his family. His Talmidim were his sons, and his sons were his Talmidim, as Moshe and Yosef said over beautifully by the Leviah. I remember that... I, when I came back from Eretz Yisrael, and I was in the base medrash, Rebbe asked me if I could learn with Moshe. And it empowered me so much to see how much my Rebbe trusts me to learn with his son. And not only that, it made Moshe feel good because he was involved with the guys. It was such a chachman, keeping all, keep making the sons, his sons, his physical sons feel good, while his Talmidim also empowering them and making them feel like sons as well and giving them that chizik. I remember I had, I remember it was in Eretz Yisrael, it was probably my second year in Eretz Yisrael, and it was during the Waterbury Shabbos in Yerushalayim. And Rebbe tells me, he goes, next year you're going to run this. So I said, okay, you know, cute. 250 people in Eretz Yisrael is, uh, you know, Everyone yells at you, it screams at you. I remember Rebbe's line was, you know, when they honk, you just, you smile and you just keep on going. And I said, okay, cute, fine. That Matzah Shabbos, I think it was the Matzah Shabbos in the Waldorf. 
And um, I remember Rebbe was talking to Zevi Khan, and Rebbe pulls me in. I don't know, know what they were talking about. He says, Zevi, next year he's going to run it. And I realized it wasn't that, it wasn't that I, I, I couldn't do it. It's that Rebbe believed in me, as I think Rabbi Sunshine said already, and many others already said. It was Kayach I had with inside me, and I didn't know I had it. And he kept on t showing me throughout the past eight, nine years, you have strength within you, and you could accomplish big things. And I believe in you. Whether it was, whether it was running a Shabbos, whether it was learning with the son, whether it was babysitting, I trust in you. Because you have it with inside of you. I believe you. I believe in you. Over the past 18 months, as has already been mentioned, they've been very challenging. And when I've tried to describe to people who didn't know Rebbe, about Rebbe's Amuna and the text you get back, about, you know, how's, how's, how's Rebbe doing? Exactly how Hashem wants me to be doing right now. And over and over, and over with such, such simcha, such simcha, it's like you would think this person is 95 years old, has lived a long life, and like, you know, lived through challenges. But, but as, as I said over, the, I remember in 12th grade, blackberries became cool because of Rebbe. Blackberries were cool because Rebbe had a blackberry. The coolest Rebbe, but yet with such real emuna and trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu that I'm exactly how HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants me to be. We should all have lots of siyat to the Shemaya. I want to thank Rabbi Sun and Shine. I want to thank Maish. I want to thank David, all the people, Zundel, all the people involved in pulling this together. I thank every person for being here. This room is, is a mitzvah of a hesped. The room itself is a eulogy. Chaim Tzvi here with his wife. Chevri here together with her. Chaim with his wife. Chaim with his wife. And Avinum with the Mishpachas, the man and family. This room itself. Maish and his tatia. The room itself is a profound eulogy. Just look at the beauty of this room, the sincerity, the greatness that lies in this room of his Talmidim. The room itself is a profound. Avi is here, Rev Avi, and what you, who you are and what everybody represents in here. The room itself is an incredible eulogy. And I thank each person. It's so appreciative. Binyamin's here from... We're all very, very busy and involved in many things in our lives, and we're here. Our world has stopped. This room itself is a eulogy, so it's tremendously appreciate each person being here. You would think, to, to say a hesped, I'm not ready to be masped, and you would think we all had a long time. We all had our Rebbe and our Chaver and our Rak, and this person who was so important to us, you would expect that we had a long time. I don't know why. I ask myself, it could be his faith that he would get better, his amuna. It, I don't know why, but I always just assumed. I assumed, I hoped and assumed that we, we would, this would be a Suda Saida. That's what I thought. And I spent 11, 12 years, hours a day, hand in hand, hours a day, there's like in there, there's things in there I can't unlock yet. I don't feel, I can, I, there's books in there. I don't feel I could unlock it yet. That various reasons, I have to figure that out also. But there's something I want to share with everybody here. There is something that I could touch and share. 
and I hope at some point I could pull, and we all could pull out more. There's, there's much, there's a lifetime of, of memories to share, of ideals, of values, of lessons of a very beautiful person. And a person who showed up in every relationship. In the room we have friends, Talmidim, Rebbeim of Rabbi, of Rabbi, of Rabbi, of Rabbi and There's so many roles he played, perfection. So unusual, a person who was a Rebbe, a family person, had this group of friends that had this like friendship. People have family and then they have a, a sh- many Talmidim. Is there like a friendship group? And he like nailed every relationship. There's a lot to unpack, a lot for all of us to learn. I want to share something I've observed from the Levaya till now, and I'd like to share this. I met friends of Rabbi Oberlander and people close to him who saw the Levaya, who saw the Shiva house, and they're like, when did this happen? What's going on? They saw hundreds of people Talmidim, they're like in shock. When did this happen? What happened? Now, they're not shocked. He was a masmid, as Rabbi Wasnicki said. He was a masmid and a big person that just wasn't how they saw him as, as a normal, like somebody who liked a good cup of coffee, a well-dressed person. And it, they just not how they saw him. He showed up as a friend, and so many friends and close people looked at the Levi and saw th- saw the crowd, Yitzhak Ben it's hard to say numbers, if it's 15, 1600, if it's less, not, no, everything has to be emistic, and that's how he'd want it, and that's how it has to be, but a huge crowd, and Talmidim, look at the Talmidim in the room, and friends who were close to him asked, when did this happen? I didn't know about this, and was shocked and surprised. So what does that say? And I, it says certainly about the tznias. It says about a neman ruach mechas not somebody who spoke over. What we shared was private. And that speaks volumes. That's not what I want to share, though. What I, what I want to say from the experience, and I want to say two points from this experience that we saw this incredible person impact so powerfully. Two points I want to say. He came to the community, Rabbi Baruch Levine, his close chaver, right? Oberlander, it took a little longer. He was dating, looking for a shidduch, and he came as a bacher. It was, he was looking for a shidduch, and he moved in. He wasn't in the dorm. He was in Rabbi Baruch Levine's house. So we owe gratitude as a chaver and Megaglin Tzchos al Yedei who shared this friend with us and with the world. And he hosted him first as a friend in the community, and he came as a bacher. I saw him, and, and, we, and I felt like, wow, I want to work with this. I want this person to be a partner. And together, we were a partner in the base Medrash. We taught together, and we're partners in the base Medrash. Everything seemed to happen, Bashkacha. Everything seemed to just... One part of the lesson is the lesson of HaMechim Mitzah De Gover. Yaakov mentioned we were part of something, we are part of something magical. This is beyond. And it all seemed, I'm sure Rai Oberlander had dreams and plans and aspirations, but I saw this unfold, it, it, was, it was orchestrated. The sense that this was orchestrated, that we were Zeich and the Yeshiva, Rai Oberlander showed up. This person who clearly, just not in an exaggerated way, forget the greatness of the man, talent-wise, was from the most talented principles in the world, it would be fair to say, dignified, well-spoken, present, incredible talent, and everything happened in such unusual ways to the point that it shocked him, us, all, his friends. When did this happen? This was set up. We're part of something that was orchestrated. We're in this room together. When? What? I remember one of the gatherings, one of the Shabbosites he made. I remember feeling this. I'm writing a poem about a general manager, the great general manager, Hashem is, what he puts together. Sometimes a coach looks very good. Sometimes players look good. But there's a smart guy in the background who put together the right trades, the silent the silent, there's a local sports team. 
It might rhyme with, it might not, forget rhyme, it might be even basketball with it. They have like a sheet to the general manners. They don't talk to the media. It's a very good visual of like somebody's orchestrating the silent one. And I want to say to us all here, and Ray Oberlander taught us, Amuna, and I want to say Le'ilu's precious soul, this beautiful person, that the sense, I can't believe we had him, I can't believe we had each other. People are like, what? When did this happen? Who did this? You're right, it's supernatural. Hashem did this all. The sense that we're part of something miraculous, that Hashem guided us and led us and put us and guided him. When did he get these skills, these abilities? When did he become a big Rosh Hashiva? Was he a big guy? Beautifully, Reb guys describing, was he Obi? When did he become the Tzaddik, the Rosh Hashiva? And of course, Rai Oblander steigt and, and was a growing, beautiful, and started big and developed big. But I think it has to be said we experienced God, you and I. And I think Ray Oberland would want us to know, in, it would want us to know this. There's a magic, there's a sense of, there's a mystery, there's something remarkable we've been part of. The yeshivas, I'm sitting here with Yehuda, the yeshiva you were part of, that he was part of, it was very quiet at the time. The whole world's leaning into the yeshiva today. Hundreds of thousands believe Guzma. But something was built by Hashem when nobody saw, when it was Samoy Minayin. It wasn't known about. I remember a certain Rashiva came. He said, I want to quit my job and travel the world and tell the world about this. He said it in Rabbi Oberlander's office. We've seen Yad Hashem. All of us have to acknowledge this is a gathering of grief for sure, but it's also a gathering of a supernatural Chabura. It's not normal. Right, Sun and China, we try to like, we're trying to like figure out when, what, when did we meet, who put this, what, we didn't grow up a group together, when did he come in, when, who brought, by Baruch's house, when was that, it's supernatural, it's supernatural, it's Hashem, it's a nice. We have seen unbelievable, remarkable stories. And Ray Oberlander is the biggest story. This, per- this person you couldn't dream to build such a yeshiva that's flourishing today. You couldn't create only God. Organize, put Waterbury, people would hear. Right, all blended, the Rayan one is in Waterbury. What's Waterbury? Oh, it's a Lebedic. what, what, who? It's a Neis Men HaShemayim, a complete miracle from Hashem. I say that we're talking, we could drink coffees together. We learned from a person who was down to earth and grounded and have, could have a Tuesday night l'chaim. He spoke like this and knew this, what I'm saying. And I feel and I sense and I, I think Yaakov, we, we're part of something, a nesmen ha-shamayim. We feel it. All of us and the beauty of this group, the guy spoke, I'm looking at Rai Sanashan, like, what is going on? Guy after guy, articulate, beautiful, this is not normal. One guy after the next. What happened? When did this happen? A nesmen ha-shamayim. There's a God, my friends, who runs this world and cares about us and brings books. What the impact? This is impacting hundreds of thousands. Beli guzma, beli guzma. This is impacting the world. I don't We'll, we'll grab more, we'll figure out more. What I could touch now is we're part of a heavenly plan. That's what you could feel. And for way too short, we were given somebody, like the perfect, the person like, this is who you would design. If you do it again, if we, if, if, if we want to do this again, somebody build them again, that's Hashem. Who put in somebody, that's one aspect. But I want to say a second point. Well, Rai Oberlander handed all of us, and I want to grab this, I want to grab it myself, I want my children, I want us all to grab it. And it's been said about trusting, he was, Guy described, was he OB, Rabbi, was he Rosh Hashiva? Did he act, did he, did he follow, right, right, son, did he follow a good script, the Rosh Hashiva playbook? Did he, was the, was the clothing exact? He was himself. 
He taught us what steiging, what growth. He was a very dehyben a person. The, the Shabbos, the, the Shabbos, the Friday nights in his home was, was very, very elevated. And in the middle of his kids were playing a card game. He was giving out challenge to each one. He was himself very much steiging, grown, but loyal to who he was. The text messages, the Blackberry that was mentioned, the, the things that were just him. He wasn't looking at a Rosh Hashiva playbook. That mattered not to him. Maybe that's the nace of the movement we're part of. Maybe that there's a lot of script and a lot of people playing a very scripted game. And he wasn't having that. He wasn't playing for somebody who actually worked in the scripted world, ironically. And he did well in the world of scripted. In a world of... He could, he, could, he could play the game, and in a nace, in supernatural, he didn't play that game. And he was involved in a yeshiva that's about not playing that game. Show up as you. Show up as us. Not playing any game, not trying to play something that somebody else asked me to play. Just me showing up. Ray Oberlander showed up as him in every relationship, in every situation. He showed up as him. Nothing more, nothing less. The beautiful him showed up to us. To me, I ask questions how he was able to do so much. It's overwhelming. How, how did he stay so present in so much of our lives? I think the answer very much connects to this point. If you try to be something, you can't be something for so many. It's, it's, it's mufrach me'elov. If it's just you, you is you is you is you and will always be you. He showed up as him. He showed up as him. And ta- teaches us and taught us and will always be a lesson to us to show up as us. If there were words to our movement, a movement of faith, of sincerity, of the holiness of a yid, of the belief in kol yachid v'yachid, his very essence was that of who showed up as him. He showed up as him, nothing more, nothing less. When we're trying to, like, Gai Shoshan's, like, we're, we're going to try for the next 50 years. Rabbi, Rabbi Silverman, who spoke Dvarim the Flam who's been impacted and is, and is running the yeshiva the last night that all the guys were talking about what Rai Silverman gave them for the, almost the whole night. Rai Silverman expressed, I think he was my best friend, but I think he was my rebbe, we're going to all clarify for years what just happened, and it's going to take time. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna like sit there, what, what just happened? What? We're going to have to do a lot of work and figuring out. But I think the shirish here is that he wasn't playing something and, and we've learned what Gadlus, what the Haibin, what big is. It's, not, it's simply not what we thought. It's not what we thought, what, what Halig, what Holy, what Kedusha, what Steiging, what Shabbos is. I was thinking the last Friday night in Yeshiva, we had 150 people on the lawn. And guys were sitting there. There were guys arm in arm with Rabbi Zon. And there was friendship. There was friendship and acceptance. I thought to myself, it's Shabbos. Did we give the guys Shabbos? And I want to say to everybody here, the chitzonius of Shabbos has a set of rules. What's the pnimius of Shabbos? Rai Oberlander loved the Sefer, Nesiva Shalom. And he asked many times the topic of the Sefer. When he learned it, it was like a mystery to me. He taught it in Yeshiva. I didn't. I never opened the Sefer. I just knew that's Rai Oberlander's Sefer. In the last couple of years, I've started to get a taste of the Sefer. Every, he, his theme is Shabbos. Any topic comes back to Shabbos. What's Shabbos Pepnimius? Chitzonius is Shabbos. What is Shabbos, the essence of Shabbos? What's the Pepnimius of Shabbos? The Mikdash and Shabbos are amazingly related. What the Beis HaMikdash is a place that you could experience Hashem. Shabbos is a time for you to experience Hashem. And there's tremendous correlation, the Mikdash and Shabbos. Friday night we greet Shabbos and we speak about the Mikdash, of course. And what's the Pneumius of Mikdash? The Chitzonius is a building with laws and rules. But what's the Mikdash? And it's clear that the essence of Mikdash and the essence of Shabbos is the essence of the Yid in front of Hashem, which means the Yid matters, the relevance of Yid, and the connection of Yid, and that's Shabbos. 
The panemius of Shabbos was what happened on the lawn that Friday night. That is, it's not on Shabbos we had a gathering. Everybody felt loved and recognized and connected. That, my friends, is Shabbos. That's the panemius of Shabbos. What happened at Oberlander's house Friday night wasn't like on Shabbos punk. There was this, in that house there was Yedidus. There was eternal friendship. In that house, we all mattered. In that house, we all were respected. We all were trusted, as has been said. That is the essence of Shabbos. The Yid, Lufnei Hashem, that he matters. That it's brought out the Neshama of a Yid, which is the connection. Achtos, the, the Nesiv Shalom speaks about this. The Pneumius of Shabbos is Achtos. And Rabbi Oberlander showed up. He showed up as himself. It, he, he reframed what we thought holiness, Chaim Tzvi describes, he said, your pleasure to take your wife. He taught us that's godless and greatness and holiness and kedusha that a husband drives his wife. He taught guys how to respect each other with dignity and class and grace. It's like these two points that his friend said he was a Rosh Hashiva. What? When did it happen? Because the friend thinks a Rosh Hashiv doesn't know what a Rosh Hashiv is. He, he has to study Rabbi Oberlander better. A Rosh Hashiv is a human being who loves other human beings and digs in and presents himself to other... Rabbi Silver and Chesky describe what a Rebbe is who presents himself to his Talmudim. I did an interview with a kid last night. I can watch what he thinks a Rebbe is. He never met Rabbi Oberlander. I watch what the... He's looking at you. You're not, a Rebbe, you show up. You're not a Rebbe if you don't show up. If you play Rebbe, then the person has no Rebbe. It wasn't an unusual Rebbe, Ray Oberlander, that he was Obi. What guy said, he taught us. We, he woke us up and is waking up. This nace is a nace that is waking up the world. That a Rebbe is a person and it wakes us up. Just be us, be us, show up as us to our life and, and let Hashem guide us. We're allowed to have plans and let Hashem guide us and show up to where He brings us. I view a person who Hashem led and He showed up where Hashem led him. Hashem carried him to our city, brought him, brought us, and He showed up. And Hashem, the Mechim Mitzah De Gover, brought us to this room and we show up. And He brings us places and let's show up as us. The thank you to Rebetzin Oberlander, to Mrs. Oberlander, for what she has given us is, again, all these things we'll dig in, we'll, we'll figure out. We could feel the, the gratitude from the Chevre is immense to, to Mrs. Oberlander, to the children, to the precious children. The precious, we sat with Moshe, Yosef, Kiki, Akiva, amazing, the daughters, the thank you to the Mishpachas, immense, and the thank you to Ray Oberlander is, is long, is deep, is profound. And Be'ez Hashem, this Chabura, this amazing Chabura, you're a testament to a real honest person. There's no shame. He was Obi. He was Obi. What happened? Was he Rebbe? The, the Rebbe, the Rosh Hashiva? Should we get here? Should we? Should, somebody's saying the Tuesday night L'chaims. Maybe don't say that. Should, should we not mention that he liked the coffee? It's not, no, let's teach the world. Please teach or show up as you. Show up as you. Show up as you. Let's talk and learn what we learned. Show up as a, but show up. Show up to our kids. Maish described what he wrote about Ray Oblender in, in brief. Describe reading. Show up when you read your book. The kid, when you read your child, that bedtime book. Show up. Don't be, that, that's, that's, the, that's Kedusha. That's, that's Halig. That's, that's otherworldly. A tat is there for a son. That's, that's the whole world. A father is there for a son. Could you ever teach anything better in the world? Is there anything ever holier, a father and son bonding? A father showed up to his son. You know the prayers, the Kedusha unleashed. That's the whole Briyas, the Tata, sh- showing up to the sons. Ani li. So the gratitude to Rai Oberlander is immense. The gratitude to Hashem. The pain is there, is, is immense. The loss is deep. But the miracle's right here. Not to, get, not to speak, to leave this gathering not saying we've been part of a miracle. We've been part of something. This is not natural. We've been pulled together. Somebody brought us here. I asked Mechila, my warped mind. I was a youngster. I read an Agatha Christie book. That's Dashkoch Hashem. 
and she has a story where a whole bunch of people don't even know who invited them to a hotel together, and it's like freaky. What they're looking around? I'm looking at this room. Who invited us together? Who brought Ray Overlander? Who? What happened? Did, did, who gave the invitation? What's going on? It's so fit that this event. It's like so fitting. We weren't sure if four people would be here, and, and, and or a hundred, or this. We didn't. We knew nothing. There wasn't so much. It's fitting because we have witnessed that Hashem brought us together. I see Reb Shmuel here, a beautiful person. Who came. Where did you come from, Reb Shmuel? Where did, I don't, I'm starting to question. I don't remember where I came. Do you remember? Right? I remember having conversations. We asked ourselves the early years. Right? Son and Shai's asking, um, what's happening here? And we've seen the Nisei Hashem. They're good people to thank. They're good people to thank. And, and, and we have to thank the, the starters of the great Waterbury Yeshiva and the Rosh Yeshiva and all the people, they're very good people to thank and appreciate, who we do appreciate and do thank. But not to say that Hashem brought us together and Hashem handed us such a gift that He took away way too fast. But we had, as the Olam said, we have Him forever, handed us a gift and arranged something and created something. The gift, it's in front of our faces. When the friends, like, when did this happen? I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> Who did this? I don't know. When? What? I, I don't know. Hashem is... It, the guy asked, I hope he helps. Everybody here knows it. See Hashem in our lives. Reb, Rebbe taught us that. See Hashem, Nemona, faith. And the second thing is show up as yourself. That is, that's Shabbos. That is faith. Show up. Show up as you. Don't play it. Don't be anybody else. I love... You came dressed like David Chaim. I love you. Show up as you and not only as you. Only, only as you. That's what we learned. That's the takeaway. Show up as you. Show up in Yemen. You're here as you. You're doing beautiful things as you. Yehud as you. I hope you came by motorcycle. I pray. <laughs> Show up as you. Show up as you and only you. Show up as you. Rebbe taught us that. Is he Obi or the Rosh Hashiva? What's the book going to say? Guy's going to figure it out. <laughs> but luckily we have Guy. Are you going to call the book Obi, Rebbe? What, what are we going to do here? Let Ray Silverman, we have smart people. Mayor Kalevsky will decide. We have very good talent. I don't know how this is all going to work. Basically, I don't know. Ca- big caches. But what he taught us is the reason we struggle. Yankov's here. Yankov. I look at Yankov. I watch him raise his family. So then, so then, then, then we understand what Rayo, Zevi can for years is a Talmud Muvuk a Rayo and he's Zevi close to Tyra. Some Rabbi Wasnicki was describing that smother satir of Rabbi, of Rabbi Obel. It's not a shack. He showed up as him to everything, to Torah, to his family, to his friends, to his Talmidim, and he showed up as him. He never played that role. No, he didn't get the memo. You're a Shashiva now. And he taught us there's a classy thing, but that's so... Yeah, he say that. I, I'm sure he put on the right shoes. I'm sure he... But that's, he taught us something deeper and more tzvi. So, the Shevach V'aydot Hashem for the gift of Rabbi Oberlander, the Tsar of Maish of what we lost is Nairada. The Aveda is an immense Aveda, there's, there's an immense loss. We're all going to dig in and feel the loss. It's going to be felt that as Levaya, the mics weren't working. I just, where is my Oberlander? He never had a problem with the mics. It never would happen. I want to mention, I want to mention that this event was set up, and he always does things quietly, to, to not thank him. Ray Oberlander was details. He'd be the first, he'd hand me a note about now, that Ray Brownstein set up this whole event and works and works for the Chabur, and I thank you, Ray Brownstein, for everything you are and do for the Chabur.
Yeah, the Aveda is immense, Shmuel. The Aveda is going to take time. This is not like a quick, we have to gather again to like process, to dig in. Different things will come our way. And he was like, where's the call? Where's the text? Where's, he, here's somebody who was sending a message, how to put on time. He was there by every big event in the yeshiva. They're always, Daniel Yartzeit, a text or a call, had it go. By, by the Eretz Yisrael Shabbos, by any graduation, before, after, during, always present in our lives and the, the loss is immense for us all. And we'll process the loss and, and Hashem should be Menachem, His children. I was younger, I had a Shaila, you allowed to wish a Nechama to Talmidim. The Shaila is not a Shaila. The Rabbi Nisham, Amokim should be Menachem. All His children, all His Talmidim, all His friends, the Rabbi Nisham should be Menachem. Hashem should be Menachem, all of His all of us who love him dearly, who are pained by his loss, and I thank you're amazing that you came, Akiva Yisrael, that you're here. That you hear Yisrael, all different years. Somebody said 13 years, I counted 16 years. That was 16 years at least. I'm not the best with years, and I mix up. I think I was with classmates, and I'm only like 10 years off sometimes. <laughs> I think I got 16 years. Tzvi is like a guy who knows dates. You'll, you'll calculate. I think David Chaim, there were 16 years. With somebody else, if I Oblander, I promise if he was here, he'd be, Daniel, it's 21, he's laughing. Hasam Kimna, the Gemara says he's here. He's like, Kalish. And he, and he wants to hand me a note, and I can't get a note now. He would know, I promise you, he'd tell me how many years it is. I have no idea. I have no idea. I have no idea. I thought 16 at one point, but I don't even remember my cheshman now. That's welcome to my brain. But, but it's a lot of years. I think it's more than 13. I'm going to say that, that I got more than 13. Yisrael, we got to figure it out. Because I can answer, what? 17, he said? Seven, it might be 17. Bemis, there's a lot of years here. <laughs> Just trust me. There's a, we, I'm not asking for birth certificates and proofs. <laughs> <laughs> Revezi knows it. Okay. There's a lot of years, Revezi, here. 17? He, he's Moscow. He's not Yisrael and Revezi. Okay. 17 years. Zevi, there's a lot of years represented here. But I, I really say to the old Hever, we love each other. I love you. We, the the Avon. Really? Oh, Rav Yitz is old. <laughs> Rav Yitz is 24. He was here at the start. <laughs> yeah, we're both here. So 24 years. Go for it all. There's many years represented here, but really, I want to express, JJ's here, the Yedidus, the friendship in this room will live forever. Our appreciation, I'm watching what Rav Avi's doing. I'm watching what you're, we're watching what the guys are doing. There's tremendous nachas in what guys are doing. Rabbi Sunshine said, we all have something we'll hold on to forever. We've all seen Yad Hashem. I thank every single person for coming. We'll end with one song. I want to sing a song, right? Sun and Shine, who is such an important person in this whole story. Somebody Ray right, Oberlander looked to as a mentor, as a Rebbe, as a friend, as a confidant. And Rabbi Sun and Shine asked Baruch Levine, who was the one who brought Ray right, Oberlander here to, as a bacher to live in his house. And Rabbi Sun and Shine asked Rabbi Baruch Levine to compose in the Waterbury Pizza Shop. So this is... The, in the deli, in the deli. The only thing more Waterbury would have been if it was been in Ami's Bagels. But I just, I can't change history. It happened in the deli. And <laughs> Kobe was thinking about a bagel that I don't know. But Lemay said, in the deli, right, right Sunshine asked Rabbi Baruch Levine to compose Chazik, a Shabbos song that speaks about our city. We're thinking about Klal Yisrael's service and difficulty that are going on in Eretz Yisrael, a middle of our difficulty. And it's all part of our difficulty. So I think to end this Maimed Diktusha with a prayer that Rai Sun and Shine asked for Baruch Levine to compose to a mentor and a friend of Rai Oblander, I think that would be a very fitting. So I asked if we all could say, but if you think we're sitting this thing, you think like now we're so old, it wouldn't be appropriate. Tough luck. We're going to hold hands singing. We're holding hands singing this. I want to sing Chazek holding hands, Maish. So I, Maish is like this big speaker and I'm like still like treating him greeny, hold hands. But Ray Oberlander taught us to be ourselves, so tough luck. So if we could hold hands and sing Chazik to close. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm tied up.
Just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.